Okay. So uh, first, I would like to just to recall what we have been doing so far. So in the two first lectures, you were looking at sum free sets in uh, finite sum free sets in Z, that is to say, sum free sets in some interval like one n. And uh, we have been studying what were the maximal ones. And then what is the structure of the one which are rather close to the maximum one? Maximum one are something which is n over two elements. And so we, go, we give the structure of something which is with a density which is less than one half. That is to say for a constant, indeed 5 over 12, but uh, I mentioned already that you can go up to uh, uh, up to uh, five, uh, 5 over all the, no, point, uh, point 0.4 times n, uh, and uh, give this structure. Now what we would like to do is to go to z over pz. z over nz will be explained, I think, by uh, Gyan in some uh, uh, separately uh, talk. Of course, with the z, z over nz, or on abelian groups in general, you always have the question that there might be some um, subsets. And so things can be a bit, a bit more complicated. So we are going to, to start with some free subset of Z over PZ and saying what are the maximal one and what is the structure of the one which has density which is close to that of the maximal one. So I recall all that because I just would like to start with some parentheses uh, today, uh, just for a few minutes, and then uh, Balasubramanian will go back to our main subject, which is some free sets, okay? So we have been talking about, uh, about Dyson, of course, and uh, about uh, the E transform and about Cauchy. So now a Cauchy theorem, cauchy davenport theorem, which is the one you see on the poster, has been uh, proved in several instances. I think you, you give a proof of it and uh, Maybe more or less, I don't know. You give a proof of it. You explain a, a few things about that. And uh, definitely uh, Mel gave a, gave a proof uh, this morning by uh, using this uh, polynomial method. So maybe just to say a few words, I'm not going to prove it completely, but uh, just to give a few words about the E-transform, which is called the, the Dyson E-transform by uh, Halberstam and Roth in sequences, but uh, Possibly it is a bit abusive because it is quite implicit, at least in uh, in man theory, in the work of man and uh, and others. So I would like to, to say something about the e transform. Just you know what it is. In any case, what I am going to to tell now. So this is why I don't give any proof or I don't go into the details. Really, just a parenthesis, so that you see what it is about. And if you are interested, it is in Mel's book. Okay. So in, by Springer. So just to tell you what is the E transform and to say something which is, let us say, a theorem, it's not that, which is the, the, the following. So again, we have A, B. It need not be in a finite set, but uh, we, there will be one point which is easier to, to mention in a finite, finite subset, but okay. Let A, B be two finite subsets. to find a subset of an adibelian group G and let E be an element of G. Then we construct, and this is the E transform, the following sets. A of E, it's not, it depends on the order in which you, you take the element. I mean, it will not, it, it is, of course, you can exchange the role of A and B, but uh, the construction is asymmetric. E of A is uh, something which is a union, something larger, B plus E. This is the translate of B by uh, the element uh, of G, which is little e, and B of E is something which starts with B, and you take the intersection of E minus A, OK? 
Okay? So you see you have, you have in some way trying to transfer maybe some elements, increase the A and, uh, and make the, the B smaller, usually. So this is what you get, and then you have, and this is definitely the property of the E transform. First of all, you have A of E plus B of E is included in A plus B, something a bit smaller, and uh, then you have E of A, which is a bit larger. You subtract the element of A, is something which is the element of B, where you subtract the element of B of E, except that this is translated, and all that was implicit or, or explicit. I, I was not at all your talk, but definitely it is in yeah, but it's, uh, you have also some variations, something like that. And um, so this is what you have. And uh, also, and for that, it's better to have them finite. E of A plus the cardinality of B of A is the same as the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. Okay, and indeed it's not, it's not that complicated. If you want, to, you can take it as an exercise, and if you have some problem with that, you just go to Mel's book, okay? Uh, and uh, then I would like to say something which is a theorem of Chola, which is proved by, again, this, this, is, this is also in, uh, in Mel's book. Huh? So, which, uh, which is some, something about the sum of, so you are looking at z over nz, n is at least 2, and a obey, so let n, a and b, in Z over NZ. And if you want to have something which looks like Cauchy theorem, you definitely need to have some, some arithmetic property of at least one of those two uh, subsets. And uh, you assume that, uh, assume that let, that zero contains B, this is not a big constraint because you can always shift B by one element, it doesn't change anything about the, the cardinality of the sum of a, anything like that. So this is not a big constraint, but it permits you to say something that you want to have, and this is a string constraint, that the GCD of B and N is equal to one when B uh, belongs, when little b belongs to B minus zero. Of course, not for zero. So you ask that all the elements, all the non-zero elements, are co-prime with n. And then you have the following. And then you have a plus b is larger or equal that the minimum, always the minimum with n. You, you cannot get something which is larger than, uh, than the whole group, of course. And uh, what is of interest for us is that you have something which is a plus B minus one, okay? So now you see that uh, you, this is really a generalization of uh, cauchy davenport theorem. If you take N, which is equal to P, then you can always shift your set B until you, f you meet a zero. And then this is obvious because you have elements which are non-zero and so they are co-prime with P. And uh, what you get now is exactly the statement of uh, cauchy davenport okay? So just one point, uh, how you would prove that, don't try the, the don't give you the, the, the details of this. And uh, then what you do is the following. First of all, this is okay if B has only one element, okay? So you are trying to, you want to show that this is true for all the, all the sets, A and B, generality. So what you do is you assume that there is some one counterexample and you take B to be a counterexample, okay? So you assume that you have B, which is a counterexample with B minimal. So we, since B is minimal, it, had, it contains at least two elements since it is a counterexample. And so what you do, you take B minimal and uh, B contains, of course, contains one, contains zero, but it contains also one non-zero element. And what you do with this non-zero element, you do the following, you use the B trans, the E transform with that element. 
And then what you do is just to prove that you still have, of course, first of all, everything when, when the minimum is n, there is nothing to say. This is absolutely trivial. So you assume that a plus b minus 1 is less than n. OK, this, you start by that. Uh, yep. And um, so you, you take the minimal counter example, and you shift one element by an element of b, which is non-zero, and this exists. And then you construct something which is another uh, counter example. And this counter example, of course, uh, as is a number of elements in B which is less than the, than the minimum, and you are done. So it's really, you can see them in some way as exercises. And if you, if you, you, you want to, to know more than that, you just go to Mel's uh, book. OK? So this was, I, and I closed the, the parentheses, and uh, we go back to what was our subject, which is some free sets. So I am now calling uh, Professor Balasubramanian. OK. Yeah, now we want to look at something on the sum free sets of Z or PZ. And we have already seen a few things. That if A is a subset of integers, sorry, if A is equal to 1 to N, and then the sum free set can have a density half, And in fact, there are examples having a density half, and which was done by Professor Desjardins. Things and either the odd integers or the next half. And now the question naturally is, what about a subset of Z or P Z? What is the density it can have? Suppose if we have some free set in Z or P Z, what is the possible density that it can have? And uh, we can have an upper bound easily. First of all, we will start with the Cauchy Davenport, which has been done several times. And the Cauchy Davenport theorem says that this cardinality is bigger than equal to two times the cardinality of a minus one. Good. On the other hand, you can also realize that this, when you look at this a plus a. And it has an empty intersection with A. OK? Because A is uh, sum free, and therefore A plus A cannot have an intersection with A. And therefore, both A plus A and A are sitting in Z over PZ. And they are disjoint. And therefore, their total cardinality cannot exceed P. Therefore, in particular, therefore, the cardinality of A plus A plus the cardinality of A cannot be exceeding P. Now use the fact that the cardinality of A plus A is bigger than 2 times cardinality of A minus 1, and that gives you something like a 3 times cardinality of A minus 1 is less than or equal to P, which tells you that this cardinality of A is less than or equal to P plus 1 over 3. Okay. Therefore, the density at most can be one third. It cannot be much bigger than that. Okay. And now you can ask the question, is it attained? And the answer is yes. And in fact, what one does is essentially take the middle one third, and the middle one third helps. For example, let me give a start with an example, let's say p equal to 101. And then this cardinality by definition has to be at most 34, correct? But you take the middle one third, 34, 35, 36, et cetera, up to 67. That gives you 34 elements. And this is sum free. And as you would expect, of course, you cannot enlarge it, because we know that sum free sets cannot have more than 34 elements. 
And it's very clear that I cannot put a 68 here because 34 plus 34 will become 68. But it is also true that I cannot put a 33 here. I cannot put a 33 here because 67 plus 67 is 33. Okay. Therefore, in this at least in this example, I cannot extend either of the ways. And it is also known that it cannot be extended because there are, can be only at most 34 elements. And of course, this, this funny thing is nothing special about primes, but the same thing I can do for odd integers. I do it for odd integers, I don't do it for even integers, for the simple reason that if I set over n is, it is, an, n is an even integer, I can reach half by the same argument which Professor Desuya was explaining by simply taking the odd elements. Because if n is an even integer, then there is something called odd numbers. Okay? And therefore, I can do that. But on the other hand, if n is odd, then you can't do it. There is nothing called an odd integer or even integer. Okay? But the same thing can be done. And therefore, by taking the middle one third, you can get the density around half, one third. Even for composite, I mean, that's what I mean. Okay, this raises the following questions. One, characterize maximal some free sets in Z or PZ where well, maybe Z or P, Z, okay, second. For composite n, is it best possible and three, what happens if I have a set A whose cardinality is not a one third but a little less? There are three type of questions that come. What are the cancelling maximum some free sets? And the composite n is it best possible? And then cardinality of a is a little less, and what happens? Okay. I mean, before I give this answer, let me make the following comment. Suppose A is contained in a group, let's say Z or P Z even, for example, some free. And now take a dilation of this A. Any such dilation is some free. Okay? Therefore, theoretically, there is no way I can characterize it because I can take a dilation, whatever characterization you give, I can have a dilation which would, of course, violate the characterization. Okay? Therefore, you have to be careful. And therefore, I will now always, in the whole sequence, I will be making a wrong statement. Therefore, let me make that wrong statement. What I mean, when I say that A has a certain property P, I do not mean that A has that property. I mean, yeah, one, yeah, dilation of A has this property.
That is the sense in which I will be saying that the set A has a property. That means not necessarily A, but there is a certain dilation of A, because if A is some free, then the every dilation is also some free, and that is the sense in which I will be talking. Okay? And now let's talk about this. What is the maximal sum free sets? This characterization is known. This is exactly the middle one term. Okay, this is exactly what I have given. For one not one, whatever I have given, that's exactly the only. In other words, suppose A is a sum free set, which is maximal, then there exists a dilation of A, such that that dilation is precisely the middial one term. Good. The second question, for composite, is it best possible? Taking the middial one third, is it best possible? The answer is no. For composite N, you can actually do better. And uh, I expect. I expect either Surya Ramana or Jan Prakash, who has some work in this direction, would probably find some time to talk on this. The third question. OK, and the third question is now what we are going to concentrate. Therefore, the question which you are going to concentrate is that therefore I have a set A whose cardinality is not one third, a little less, then is it possible that you should be able to characterize that set? Good. Therefore, now let me make the conjecture. A is a subset of that over Bz, some free. The cardinality of A is C times P, where C is a constant less than one third, but not too small. Then A is really the middle one third. If A is one third, then this is exactly one cardinality of A to P minus cardinality of A is one third to two third. Okay. And if it A is a little less, so it's like 0.3, then I am saying that it would contain between 0.3P to 0.7P. Good. Okay, now, sorry. Oh, okay, what do I mean is that I have a 0 to p. Let us assume that the cardinality of a is equal to 0.3p, for example. Yeah, okay. And then a is some free. Then there is a dilation of a, okay, which would be sitting between 0.3p to 0.7p, which is all what I mean by sitting in the middle. Yeah, therefore, when I say that it will be sitting in the middle, that's exactly what I mean, 0.3p to 0.7p. And uh, we have reasons to believe that uh, we cannot do much better than that. I mean, you can always find examples. OK, in any case, OK, therefore, let me first of all say what is known. OK, what is known? OK, therefore, let's see. Therefore, yeah, what is known? If c is bigger than or equal to 0. 3, 3, it is true, and that is due to Lev. Correct, if I'm going wrongly then. And if C is bigger than or equal to 0. 0.324, then it is true, and that is due to this way and Freeman.
And if C is bigger than or equal to 0.318, therefore we seem to be going in an arithmetic progression of size 0 0.06, okay? And that is due to the Jouet and Leu. Good. Therefore, even though about B, the thing I said related to people who have some work on it can give the talk, but about the C, I am not going to say any such a thing because anyway, I don't have any work at all, but since this has a work, and that is a work which I want to explain now. That is exactly what, what is this idea of proving 0.318. Okay, therefore, that is the theorem which you will be proving. That if C is point, therefore, if the A is a subfree set and the cardinality of A is bigger than 0.318p, then such a A would lie between cardinality of A and P minus cardinality of A. Is it okay? That's what we are working, and that's exactly the reason why he wanted me to give the things that we are working, and we, I mean, we sort of can go actually up to point three with a very long proof, and trying to see, we write it down, a yeah, slightly weaker possible, if with not so long a proof. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And in fact, I have been writing all these things, et cetera, because as Professor Desu was pointing out, there is one advantage in giving a blackboard lecture, which means that whatever you want to keep, you can keep. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. In this part, I will be essentially keeping whatever I need, and all the working will be in the other part. No, I'll do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's time, exactly. OK, sorry, therefore, in whatever I was saying. If C is around 0.25p, 25, then the result is false. This is due to C. He constructed a set A of whose cardinality is around 0.25p, such that there is no dilate of that set, which lies between cardinality of A and P minus cardinality of A. Okay, and if the time permits, probably I will also talk about that, the uh, construction. Yeah, that's, yeah, I wanted to say that, I just forgot, thanks. Therefore, let's keep the things clear here. A is a subset of Z over P Z. I can even assume that the cardinality of A is 0.318 P, and I can assume that A is some free. Then I want to prove something. Okay. There is also another comment, again, which was made by Professor Dishway in his lecture. Okay, and therefore let me recall the comment that there is essentially a folk folklore theorem which says, oh. Okay, I should also make it very clear. When I say A is in subset, at different, different times, I will be using different, different model. This will be one model which I will be using. This will be another model which I will be using. And there will be a third model which I will be using for the tower P set. Okay, at different times, different models will be used for the tower P set. And the Fulcro theorem says that given this model, Oh, yeah, given this model, if A is uniformly distributed, then A hat T is small 
for all t not equal to 0. Conversely, if some a hat t is big, say a 1 is big, a hat 1 is big, then some half circle contains more points than its complement. Therefore, if this a hat one is large, then some thing contains more points than its complement. And now I said that a hat is big, let us say a hat one is big, but saying that this a hat one is big is no loss of generality, which is what I first I want to explain. This is no loss of generality for the simple reason that if you take B is a dilation of A, and then if you look at B hat 1, oh, I have not defined B hat, but I think this has been defined a thousand and one times. But anyway, still let me define this. That is a B hat 1, which is nothing but summation e power 2 pi a t a by p a in a, which is nothing but a hat t. Which means to say a hat 1 and a hat t are just a dilation of each other. Since a hat 1 and a hat t are dilation of each other, given a hat t, and therefore whether I say some a hat t is big or a hat 1 is big, it does not really matter because it is a dilation. Good. And now, this particular statement and uh, so this way also gave some statement to exactly say what this means, but what I need is a more precise statement than that and therefore let me state that first. Let S is equal to A hat 1, then there exists an half circle. When I say half circle, I take the third model, say u, u plus p by 2, which I mean I take the first model, okay, half circle, say u, u plus 2 by 2, containing more than cardinality of a by 2 plus p over 2 pi arc sin, arc sin is the same as what sin inverse as you write, cardinality of s into sin pi by p. Therefore, in particular, your a hat 1 is rather big, then of course this number arc sin mod s sin pi by p is rather a big number and therefore you are adding that. Therefore, there is an off circle which contains a lot of points. You know, kernel of a to much more than that. This essentially means that we should get actually a lower bound for a hat 1, okay, which is exactly what we are going to do next. Good. Up to this is okay? Yes. Sorry? I am writing small? Okay. Oh, okay. I will make it bigger. Sorry. Now, therefore, the first thing which I have to do is essentially the two statements, A contain uh, this is a crucial formula, okay. Cardinality of A over 2 plus P by 2 pi or sine cardinality of S sine pi over P.
Therefore, it has more elements. One half circle has a lot of elements. Okay. And therefore, we should get a bound for the cardinal derivatives. And therefore, whatever information is given to us is these two informations. And therefore, now these two informations, now we should probably write in the Fourier form. Okay, what is the information in the Fourier form? And this is probably the strongest that is known today in this thing. Okay. Now let's start with this following. Okay. This is something which has been done thousand times and therefore let me still do it once. Okay, this probably has been done because what you have is a summation over t, summation over a1, summation over a2, e power 2 pi i a1 minus a2 into t over p. And then you can interchange the summation. And the inside summation survives only when a1 equal to a2, otherwise it doesn't survive. And when a1 equal to a2, the inside summation gives you p, and therefore you get summation mod a hat t square is equal to p times k. Okay? But you know, in our theorem, we are now interested in a hat t for non-zero t. Since we are interested in the a hat t for non-zero t, therefore the text is the temp corresponding t equal to zero separately. The term corresponding to zero, you can take it out separately. But again, by definition, a hat zero, is the cardinality of a because it is some e power 2 pi a over a t over p. Therefore, a, therefore, this is cardinality of a whole square. Okay. But you see, the left hand side has certain multiplicity which I don't like. Why is it having a multiplicity? It is having a multiplicity essentially because if you are having a hat of minus t, which is nothing but a summation e power minus 2 pi a t over p, which is just nothing but a hat t conju complex conjugate. A hat minus t is nothing but the co complex conjugate of a hat t. Therefore, when you are looking at the a hat t whole square, then t and minus t will give you the same contribution. Okay, the multiplicity I don't like. Therefore, let me kill the multiplicity. Therefore, in order to kill the multiplicity, the obvious thing is essentially now to take the set z over p z star modulo an equivalence relation, and this equivalent relation being x equal to minus x. Therefore, if in t if x is counted, minus x is not counted. And this nice equivalence relation is perfectly okay. And therefore, it follows that summation t is equal t in t mod a hat t whole square is equal to p times cardinality of a minus cardinality of a whole square divided by 2. And that is what from the fact of given the cardinality that is the fact which we know. Let me write that again carefully summation t belonging to t mod a hat t whole square is equal to p times cardinality of a minus cardinality of a whole square divided by 2 and I will leave the calculations to you. You will get something like a point one zero four eight p square.
OK? Therefore, this particular statement has been done in the Fourier form. Now we have to write the other statement. A is some free in the Fourier form. Therefore, now let me try to write A is some free in the Fourier form. You start with the summation of a hat t whole square times just a hat t. If you look at the a hat t whole square sub a hat t, this is nothing but the summation a1 a2 e power 2 pi i a1 minus a2 to t divided by p. This comes from the a hat t whole square and then the a hat t gives you summation over a3 e power 2 pi i a3 into t divided by p and then outside you have a summation over t. Okay. And therefore, this is nothing but the summation over a1, a2, a3, summation over t e power 2 pi i a1 minus a2 plus a3 into t divided by p. And the fact that this a is some free means that a1 minus a2 plus a3 is never 0. And therefore, the inside summation is always 0, OK? Because a1 minus a2 plus a3 is not 0. That, therefore, this that essentially means that this is equal to 0. Now, as usual, t equal to 0, we separate it out and go modulo the equals relation. And therefore, t equal to 0, when you separate it out, you will get t is equal to 1 to p minus 1 mod a hat t whole square into a hat t equal to minus a hat t whole, a hat 0 whole cube, which is just the equal to modulus of a cube. Yeah, it's the same as some free. Yeah, we are not losing anything. Yeah, it's exactly some free. And therefore, this is what happens. And then now you know that a hat t and a hat minus t are conjugate of each other. And therefore, you can combine both of them. And that would give you two times summation over t equal to 1 to t belonging to t, real part of a hat t mod a hat t whole square is equal to minus a cube. Therefore, in particular, you get summation over t belongs to t mod a hat t whole cube is bigger than or equal to cardinality of a cube divided by 2. And that I leave it to you to check that gives you something like a 0 0.016 pq. Okay, therefore you have a uh, equality for mod a hat t whole square, you also have an equality for mod a hat t whole cube. And therefore by dividing, you would get a formula for the maximum a hat t. Therefore, this gives you a maximum a hat t, which I am not going to write because I am not going to keep it. And therefore, you would already know that this is, I am not so interested in it. Just dividing, because you have a equality for mod a hat t whole square, you have a equality for mod a hat t whole cube by dividing the for mod a hat t maximum of that. But the maximum of mod a hat t and a hat 1 are the same as I said, because a hat t, whatever the baby the t, is a dilation of a hat 1. Therefore, you have a lower bound for a hat 1 is bigger than 0.148. Is it okay?
Because no, it's a step clear. Once you have a bound here and bound here, when you divide it, then you will get a bound always being continuous. Now, one of the natural questions which you can ask is that given these two equations, is this all what you can gain or can you do better? Given two such equations, is this all what you can gain or can you do better? Okay, therefore, let me start again with an example. I start just with the three elements, three, three, two. Then this gives you x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to 8 and x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square is equal to 22. And if I use the same trick, I have a bound for x1 plus x2 plus x3, x1 square plus x2 square. This should give you a bound for the maximum. And therefore, the maximum which we will be getting is bigger than or equal to 22 by 8. Which, even though a correct statement, you know that this is not perfect. Because I know the maximum x i equal to 3. They were given such two equations such as that, like this, and is it some method by which you can actually get maximum x i equal to 3 itself from these two equations, okay? And that is in fact possible, therefore let me state it. Here on. Let x1 bigger than or equal to x2, etc., bigger than or equal to xn. Now assume that x1 plus x2 plus etc., xn equal to a, and assume x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square, etc., up to x1 square is less than or equal to, sorry, greater than or equal to b. From that, you will get a maximum of x i is bigger than or is equal to b over, sorry, I, even, I, I can even have a some other power. Then you will get a maximum of x i power l minus 1 is bigger than or equal to b minus a. You can ask whether you can improve that. You can now take your k to be exactly is equal to summation is a power l divided by b, take the power 1 over l minus 1 and take the fractional part. And then solve the following equations, ku plus b is equal to a, k times u power l plus b power l is equal to b. You define k is equal to a power l by b power 1 over l minus 1, the integral part of that, and then solve the equation ku plus b equal to a, ku power l plus b power l equal to b. Then, maximum xi is bigger than or equal to q. Okay. Let us see how the thing works in our example, for example. Okay. In our example, L A is equal to 8, B is equal to 22, L is equal to 1, 2, and therefore my K is equal to A power L, 64, divided by 22, power 1 over L minus 1 is power 1, and this number is exactly 2. And then you have to solve the equation 2u plus v is equal to 8 and 2u square plus v square equal to 22. Oh, and uh, you can also assume that v less than or equal to u always. Okay, and you can solve this equation. And this equation essentially has two solutions uv equal to 3, 2 is one solution and uv is equal to 7 over 
3, 10 over 3 is another solution. And the second solution doesn't work because u is not less than v, therefore the first solution works. And it says maximum of xi is bigger than or equal to u and u equal to 3, and therefore you got your 3. Therefore, from these two equations itself, you can get a lower bound which is optimal. Optimal, optimal, yeah. Oh, sorry. This one, yeah. I solved 2u plus v equal to 8, 2u square. This set, this set, main statement, yeah. Okay. Therefore, I have x1 plus x2 plus x1 equal to a. x1 power l plus x2 power l etc. plus x1 power l is bigger than or equal to b. And then you define your k to be a power l over b, 1 over l minus 1, integral part of that. And then solve this equation, ku plus v equal to a, ku power l plus v power l equal to b. And then that u, x maximum xi will be bigger than or equal to u. Okay. For any of you who are wondering what, what all these things mean, let me just say that given these equations, the extremal solution, the extremal solution will look like that. That's all what it means. And that is where your ku plus v is equal to a and ku power l plus v power l equal to b, etc. all come. And that is precisely what I am going to apply in my case. And in my case, I am going to apply it with the xi is equal to ati. I am going to apply with the xi is equal to mod ata square and l is equal to 3 by 2. And therefore, the first equation x1 plus x2 plus xi, xn becomes precisely this equation. And then x1 power 3, l plus x2 power l etc. becomes precisely this equation. And then I can do all those calculations. Then instead of getting this point, oh, point 148, which I said, and therefore, which I did not even record because that is weak, I will actually get I will get point 0.152p, which is a slight improvement at that point 148 of the standard I argument. Is it clear? Up to that, it's okay. Is this any problem so far? No. Okay. That part is over. Therefore, I have got a bound for a hat 1. Of course, I am not getting a bound for a hat 1. I get a bound for maximum of mod a hat t, but on the other hand, it does not really matter. Maximum of a hat t is, which I can call a hat 1 by a dilation. Therefore, a hat 1 is 0 0.152p. And therefore, now you can use the theorem of Lev. The theorem of Lev says that is once a hat 1 is large, then there is a half circle which contains a lot of points. And in fact, it tells you exactly what it is. It is n over 2 plus p by 2 pi into r sin modulus s sin pi by p. And therefore, now use the theorem of Lev. To conclude that there exists an half circle Let us call u, u plus p, u, u plus p by 2 containing 
m points where m is bigger than or equal to 0.238p. Now, we are out of this point, 318 points, 0.238 points are already in your half circle. Okay? Therefore, now that is the situation we are in. Therefore, take this model. You have this A, but now there is an half circle which has more than M points, where M is 0.238p. Once you have a lot of points in an off circle, then you can try to do something with that. Is it okay? Good. And now what? The next step is another folklore theorem. Suppose you have an interval i. and A is contained in this i and the cardinality of A is equal to m, then A plus A has fewer points if the i is smaller intervals. If you have a small interval and you have m points, the number of points are the same. If you have a small interval and m points, then the a plus a will be small. But on the other hand, if you have a spread, your interval is already spread and you have m points, then a plus a will be much bigger. Okay? And now look at these m points. Take their a plus a. Their a plus a, therefore take these m points call it n naught, this a plus a, n naught plus a naught cannot be very big because this a naught plus a naught has to be contained in a complement, b some free. Therefore, a naught plus a naught has to be in a complement being some free and consequently this cannot be very big. That essentially means that probably that this particular a naught is not spread throughout this half circle, but even there it is confined to a smaller interval. Good. And that is given by the following theorem. Let A be contained in 0L and assume that 0 belongs to A and L belongs to A, then A plus A is bigger than or equal to minimum of L plus M and 3M minus 3. Which means that if A is in a much bigger thing, the L plus A will go up. Okay? Good. I think that's exactly the time. And with that theorem, I will start tomorrow. Okay? But you yourself can do as an exercise that, that this cannot hold. A plus A cannot be bigger than 3M minus 3. Because if a plus a is bigger than 3a minus 3, a plus a has an empty intersection with a, therefore both a plus a has to be sitting and a, a has to be sitting, and a has a cardinality 0.318, and a plus a then cardinality 3 times 0.238, and that whole thing will then blow up bigger than 1. Therefore, this is not possible, and therefore, this is all what is possible, and with that we will start tomorrow.